So uh, this is 1.4. I, I forget exactly what this section is titled, but the topic is matrix vector multiplication. And then some related stuff like matrix equations. Um, so we can multiply We can multiply a matrix by a vector sum. I will I will come back to this word in a moment, but for now, let's finish this. We can multiply a matrix by a vector. When we do the result is a So a matrix times a vector is a vector. And this multiplication is therefore kind of different from the multiplication you're used to. Um, you're used to multiplying the same types of things together. You can multiply two numbers together, or you can foil two quadratic polynomials together, or stuff like that. Here we're multiplying two different objects, a matrix and a vector. And again, the result is a vector. And now returning to this word sometimes, it's a question of dimension. So a matrix, remember, has a dimension. The first number is the number of rows. The second number is the number of columns. If we're going to multiply a matrix by a vector, this vector has to have as many rows as the matrix had columns. So if you write them next to each other like this, these inner numbers have to be the same. Um, in this class and any class where we use column vectors, the multiplication will always be written in this order. That's another difference. When you're multiplying numbers, order doesn't matter. If you're multiplying polynomials, order doesn't matter. If you're multiplying a matrix by a vector, you write the matrix first and the vector second. And the definition is probably not going to jump out to most students as 
obvious. I mean, like, probably most people in this class could sort of guess how vector addition was going to work. I mean, probably if you told people, I want to add these vectors together, figure out a way to do it, most people would eventually settle on, well, what if we added a cross like that? Um, by contrast, I don't know that most people would figure out this definition of matrix vector multiplication on their own. It's a little strange, but let's say we have a two by three matrix and a three by one vector. We can multiply these things because the inner dimensions match. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the columns of the matrix and the entries of the vector And we're going to turn them into a linear expression where we have scalars and vectors and the entries of this vector here are going to provide us with the scalars and the columns over here are going to provide us with the vector. And I probably just need to write this down. Um, that was probably borderline incoherent. We take the first entry of the vector. So this one here. And we scale or multiply it by the first column of the vector. By that one, two there. Then we take the second entry of the vector, this negative four, and we scale or multiply it with the second column. this three is seven. And finally, we take the third entry of the vector, that six. Um, and if we don't see any negative signs, then we're adding. So we'll plus six. Let's try that six again. Plus six. Scaled or multiplied with the third vector. And there's how we perform matrix vector multiplication. If you've seen this uh, material before and you're thinking, wait a minute, I learned something else. I took the row and I multiplied by the column and I added. Um, that's an alternative algorithm. We'll get to it. This is, so this is going to be our definition. This is how we define matrix vector multiplication. And the result then, 
And, and the fancy sounding phrase we use is that this is a weighted sum. It's a sum because we're adding vectors up. It's weighted because we have these numbers in front of the vectors. And I mean, by the way, I, I guess I haven't finished the problem. So this is one, two, minus 12, 28, plus zero, 24, one minus 12 plus zero is negative 11, two minus 28 is negative 26, plus 24, is negative two. And this is not, as I've said, the world's most intuitive way of defining a product. Um, but it's going to be probably the most helpful way. Because what this understanding of multiplication does is give us another way of thinking about systems of linear equations, and it gives us another way of thinking about um, vector equations. Let me make the statement that systems of linear equations vector equations and now matrix equations we haven't put any matrix equations on the board, but we will in a moment. Uh, three different ways of expressing the same thing. And if sometimes you would see a statement like that and you'd think, well, that's bad. It means we have a lot of redundancy. But um, it's going to turn out, and we're going to see this throughout the course, that it's actually really helpful to have these three different ways of expressing the same thing. That um, sometimes one is easier to work with and sometimes another is easier to work with. And let's take this statement and let's run with it. Let's see why it's true. I mean, first, we'd better explain what we mean by a matrix equation. A matrix equation is when you have a known matrix. times an unknown vector equal to unknown. 
factor. And a matrix equation is really a vector equation because a matrix times a vector is a bunch of vectors added up. Um, to see specifically how this works, let's say we have 3x plus 4y minus z equals 12, 2x minus y plus 2z equals 1. So here's a system of linear equations. The system of linear equations is the same as a vector equation, where you have the unknown x times 3, 2, plus the unknown y times 4, negative 1, plus the unknown z, times negative one, two, equals 12, one. We saw this sort of thing, where did we see it? We saw it here. Well, um, we were going in the other direction on this frame, but we started with a vector equation, and we saw that it was the same as a system of linear equations. So a vector equation is the same as a system of linear equations, and this is now the same as the matrix that has these vectors as its columns. Times the unknown vector, x, y, z, equals the vector 12 of 1. Three different ways of expressing the same idea. So I'm going to, because I'm close to finishing this section and we're scheduled to, I'm going to run through the next theorem a little quickly. I'd like to have had five more minutes to dwell on it, but I've got a meeting right after this class. Uh, let's, we can state this as a theorem. A x equals B always has a solution if and only if every row of A has a pivot position in A. Thank you.
the theorem is not super hard to understand as long as we've really internalized these definitions. Of course, I say that as somebody who has spent a lot of time doing just that for a student, maybe a little trickier. Um, but remember, when would you not have a solution? The way to not have a solution is to have something like this after you've performed your row reduction. Zeros everywhere, and then something that isn't zero. Well, to solve AX equals B, we solve it using Gauss-Jordan elimination. Again, I would have liked to have had 10 or so more minutes to dwell on this. But to solve AX equals B, we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on that augmented matrix. The matrix A with the B stuck on the N. If every row of A has a pivot position, Remember that a pivot position is a non-zero entry after we perform the row reduction. So if the first row has a pivot position, then after we perform the row reduction, there's something in that first row that isn't zero. And if the second row has a pivot position, there's something in that second row that isn't zero, and so on. Every row has something in it that isn't zero. And because of that, it doesn't matter what you have over there in the last column, the only way to not have solutions is to have a row that looks like this, but none of the rows can look like that. because all of the rows have some non-zero entry in them. Finally, gosh, we have two minutes left. Um, the alternate algorithm, you don't need to do the homework. You can um, find it in my notes on Canvas. I have a video on it. I hope, I'm now talking to my online students. Again, I hope you're watching those videos because they're really, I mean, they're designed for you. I, I record my lecture, but it is not best practice for online students to watch 40 minute videos most of the time. So I hope you're all, at, if they're watching these, I mean, I'm glad you're welcome to, that's why they're there, but I do hope you are watching the stuff that was specifically created for you. And I will see you Tuesday. Um, long weekend does not affect this class, but I hope you enjoy it. Thanks.